I have been actually working on a bit of a web page and a place where we can post some of these. So if you know someone that has missed a, a Sunday morning worship service and they want to catch up, um, we'll be able to do that off, off of our web page once that gets finished up. So, well, this morning we are going to be looking at the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 5 through 13, and you should have all the verses there in front of you. But before we get started, let's pray and ask God to be with us as we read his word and hear from him. I, our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that it is true and that it gives us instruction how to live, but more importantly, that it gives us life, eternal life. And through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray right now that as we look at your word, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, and help us to see that this is just not only your word, but it's your word to us. And we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our text is going to be from Hebrews chapter 2, and let's read from verse 5. For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But, we, but now we do, not, we do not yet see all things subjected to him, but we do see him who was made a little, for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. <clears throat> For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. So far, the reading of God's wonderful and holy word. It seems like a very heavy passage. It, it's almost that it, when you read this passage, it's just like you almost go dragging through this, finding out what is the author of Hebrews saying. Well, I want to start out with asking a question. What would, what would this world look like if Adam had never sinned? What if he had never sinned? It would be a perfect world, wouldn't it? We'd never have to worry about broken bones, messiness, sin, death, disease. We wouldn't have to worry about bad politicians or anything like that. All of this would be taken care of. And that would be a wonderful thing. And I am pretty much assured that most people, most, I'm not saying everyone, but most people are aware that something is wrong with this world. Even atheists, even communists, they know that there's something wrong with this world. And how do I know that? Because they strive for a utopia. They want to make it better. So obviously there's something wrong with what's going on in the first place, but it's like Everyone is trying to say, I've got this idea, I've got this idea, how to make this world a better place. But we know the better way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. A man by the name of J.V. Fesco once summed up the problem with this world. 
And he said it like this. The heart of the problem with this world is the heart of man. That's really what the problem that we are dealing with in this world. There's one side of politics that says it's business and everything else that's the problem. See all those greedy people. And then there's another part that says it's government. Look at all those corrupt people. There's a common denominator in all of that. Corrupt people. Fallen human beings. That's where it really lies. We are fallen human beings and we all need the Lord Jesus. Mankind is the problem, yet we cannot solve that problem by eliminating ourselves, right? I mean, because that's really where the problem lies. If we want to get rid of evil, I'd say, well, then start with ourselves. Start with yourself because the problem is our heart. So, like, I, I'm sure you've probably heard the phrase, wherever you go, there you are. No matter where you go, your problems follow you. There is where your heart is. Well, last week, we talked about these things. We talked about what a perfect president, if we had a perfect president, we'd still have our problems at home. We'd still have all the problems that we have, whether it's rebellious kids or or a, a husband or a wife that drinks or is abusive, we'd still have all of those problems that exist that we have. We'd still have bitterness, strife, envy, envy and covetousness. At one time, though, that is not who we were. Adam was in a perfect relationship with God. He walked and talked with God in the Garden of Eden. He had a perfect relationship. He had it going for him until Satan came along. He you know, Jesus, well, Adam was growing and enlarging the Garden of Eden, but then sin came into this world. But right now, let's get back to the book of Hebrews, because right now, the, so far we have looked at Hebrews, we've looked at the reality and the preeminence of Jesus Christ, that he is greater than the angels. We've looked at the sonship and that kingship of Jesus and that we are co-heirs with Christ. Remember that, that we are co-heirs with him. And we also talked about how he willingly became a servant. He had the right to be king of this world, but he chose to come to this world as a baby and to be a servant for us. He washed the disciples' feet. The king of the universe got down on his knees and he washed the feet of the disciples. What a humbling experience for us to think about. We've also learned that last week not to neglect this great salvation, not to assume the gospel. And now we're going to look at a little bit of this process of how we become part of the family of God, how we become the children of God. And he starts out in, in verse 5, he says, For he did not subject the angels to angels, the world to come, concerning what we are speaking. What he is saying there is he's saying, angels are not in charge now. The angels will not be in charge of a new world. But we're going to be looking at four different things today and Unfortunately, when I put the hole punch in, I put it through some of the points, so you'll have to use your pin and fill part of that out. The first one is the potential of mankind, our potential. The second point is the problem of sin. And then we look at the pioneer of salvation the pioneer of our salvation, and then lastly, proclaimed into the family of God. Proclaimed into the family of God. And he starts out by saying, first of all, angels are not the ones in charge, but then in verse 6, but one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? For you made him for a little while lower than the angels you have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands you have subject put all things in subjection under his feet 
For in subjecting all things to him, he had left nothing that is not subject to him. The words you see there on the, on the handout that are in all caps, that's in the texting world, that would be shouting, but that's not what was happening here. It's a quote from the Old Testament, whenever you see that in all caps in this, this handout that we have today. That's a quote from the Old Testament. And that's a quote from Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. I want to take the verse in front of that, the verse behind that, to give us a little bit of context of what is saying. When I consider your heavens, in Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over, rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God made us to rule this world. That was his intentional plan. And he talks about this in Genesis. And he says that when he made us in his image, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit from here, he made us in his image, he says, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. To me, that is an interesting passage because it says men and humanity, you are in charge of all creation. You get to decide what happens here to this, to this planet and everything on it. And unfortunately, in our sinful nature, we, we have worked on partially destroying it. We have done all sorts of things. The one thing, though, that I do like about it is... The fact that it, it says all these things we rule over. And then when we read later on in, in, in Genesis, it, it talks about all these things are for our food. The plants, the fish, the animals. Every hunter should love this passage. Because guess what? We have that right to harvest and to make plenty food for our plate. And that, to me, is just one of the most wonderful things because he talks about it here. He says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has lives, I have given the every green plant for food. He has given all of these things for us for food. And that is a wonderful thing that he has done. Now, I can also tell you, we don't have perfect dominion in a lot of ways, because guess what? When we go out into the woods, when we go out into places that have wild animals, they're, they don't, they're not subject to us. They don't listen to us. In fact, if a wild bear charges at you, that's a perfect example. It's not, they're not subject to us. They don't listen to us. But yet in Adam's world, before sin, that took place. They were all subject to us. And it's hard to understand in our world that we see today, but this is true. And then also, one of the things he talks about in Genesis chapter 1 is he says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. You see, we're different from every beast of, the, of the, this world. No animal was made in the image of God. And God intended for us to be his image bearers, to proclaim his name, to proclaim him throughout this whole world. And that is what God wants us to be, image bearers, and to have dominion. But the problem of sin arises because 
And the author of Hebrews says, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Well, guess what? And that's obvious, isn't it? I mean, whether it's us hurting this world or whether the animals that hurt us or go after us have had dogs bite me. So guess what? All things are not subject to us yet. And we don't know how to rightfully care for this world in a perfect way. We do our best. And Genesis chapter 3 says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. And then after the flood, after Noah's flood, when he came out, there was almost a second stating of that of dominion. But this time it's a little bit truncated. It's a little bit less than what that original was. He says, when, he, Adam, when God spoke to Noah, he says, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth that they may breed abundantly <coughs> on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So again, that's a little bit less. Go out and let them propagate and let them fill, this, fill the earth with this. <coughs> the interesting part is, is after we've looked at our potential and after we have looked at the problem of sin, now we see the pioneer of our salvation. And that's where we start out in verse 9. It says, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might face death for everyone. In the verses up above that we looked at, one of the things that we see is, is like in the end of verse 8, it says, but now we do not see all things subjected to him. That's small age. That's us. In the next verse, it says, but we, we, here's the emphasis that I like to put on it. But we do see him, capital H, that would be Jesus, who was made for a little while lower than the angels. And then the author states it plainly, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. One of the interesting things is as we read through the Gospels, is Jesus doesn't really call his disciples brethren until the cross, <coughs> after the cross. We don't see him call. He says, you are my disciples. He says, so he calls them <coughs> servants. But at the cross and after that, he calls them brother. That is an interesting thing for us to understand. It says, because he says this, Jesus will be the one that will lead us. And then probably God asking, where, does we, where do we get the fact that Jesus leads us? And to have rule and have a new dominion over a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 10, it says, For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. One of the things we also find out is he says, through bringing many sons to glory. He's not excluding daughters. I want us to be clear on that because one of the things that the, that the, the Apostle Paul does in his writings and this author here does, is they use the concept of Roman adoption. And when a son is adopted into a family, in a Roman family, that's good as gold. It's like you were born into that family. And this was the first way we understand adoption in our world that we have. We pull that model, our model of adoption from them. It is as if that person was born into the family. It's not like they're a servant. Well, you know, if the person was adopted into a family, they're not second-class citizens. 
but they are sons and they have the right to the same heirship as a son born into that family. And that's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> but then one of the things he says is up here is in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Now, I, one of the things I did is I looked this up in different translations, and there's different words that are used because one of the things that I've learned is, is when we look at the original languages, whether it's Greek or Hebrew, and we try to translate them into English, we lose a lot. In other words, it would be like trying to take something 220 and plug it into 110. It just doesn't work. So we have to explain some of the things here. And I looked at these in different translations, and one translation <coughs> had, instead of the word author of their salvation, one said captain. And I like that, because it gives that sense of here is that leader. The other part is, one version used pioneer. I kind of like that one too, because later on in the book of Hebrews, we'll find out why that is probably a very fitting word for here. What is a pioneer? When we think of a pioneer, we think of Lewis and Clark, right? The people that have gone before us into uncharted territory. What was the uncharted territory that Jesus went through that we will go through? Death. He went there. People are afraid of death in this world. Why? Frankly, because they don't know what's on the other side. They don't have assurance that there is something better on the other side. But we have Jesus, who was the pioneer of our salvation. He experienced death. He tasted death for everyone. It tells us right that in verse 9. He tasted death for everyone. And because of that, he died, he rose again, he came back, he taught the disciples even more. We have that perfect author, that perfect captain, that perfect pioneer of our salvation. <coughs> and then the other thing that when we, says, he says here, says, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things. This is referencing God in his creative work. When Jesus was the one, when we discovered the other week, that Jesus was the one, the active <coughs> participant in creation. <coughs> Did you know that all creation is waiting for us to become fully realized as sons and daughters of God? Do you realize that? And... and, and uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22, it says, For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. When I fully become all that God has intended to, for me to be in a resurrected body, in a new heavens, in a new, in a new earth, it says, that the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For, for the creation was not subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, Jesus, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. When we see the tragedies that happen in this world, when we see floods, <coughs> when we see tsunamis, when we see earthquakes, when we see hurricanes devastate and destroy homes, lives, pets, animals, fires, <coughs> this is not a perfect creation. It is because of our sins that we deal with what we deal with now. Even the things that we have in our body that ail us, this is because of sin. And, this is, and <coughs> I am so looking forward 
to not just a brand new body that will not have any problems, but I'm looking forward to a world that isn't going to be having all these earthquakes, all this pestilence, fires, <coughs> floods, or anything like that. We will be on a perfect earth, and that to me is awesome word to think about. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their, their salvation through sufferings. One of the things that Colossians <coughs> tells us is this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And the language right there is, is the premier of all creation is the way we need to understand that. That he wasn't the first thing created, but he would actually was the premier of all creation. It says, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through <coughs> him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning. Now listen to this next part. The firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have first place in everything. That he was the firstborn from the dead, <coughs> and we are to follow. He is that pioneer. So he is the... We've seen the potential of mankind. We have seen the problem of sin. We have seen that he is the pioneer of our salvation and then that we are proclaimed in the family. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. For he who sanctifies, who is that? Jesus is where that part of that verse and those who are sanctified that's us we are clean fully clean now we don't we don't clean ourselves up it says right here he cleans us he cleans us up and we need to remember that that i can't make myself clean before i become a christian and that i cannot keep myself clean as a christian I need that cleansing power of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life every day of my life. And he has done that. <clears throat> and then he says, um, he says, he is not ashamed to call them brother. Then remember that we looked at that in Romans chapter 8. Remember we talked about creation in verses 19 to 22. But if you look at two verses before that, Verses 16 and 17, he says, The Spirit himself, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit that we are what? Children of God. And of children, heirs. Heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. Then John chapter 1 in verses 12 and 13 talks about how we and when when we receive Jesus Christ what does that give us it says but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe on his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor the will of man but of God and again it goes to show right there it's not our will it's by God's will that we are his children. But he calls us his brethren, and he's not ashamed to call us his brethren. And the author of Hebrews uses the Psalms here in Psalm 22, and says, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Who's speaking there? That's Jesus. Jesus is standing up in the congregation and saying, I will proclaim your name. I will proclaim your name. I will proclaim your name in the midst of the congregation. That's not us proclaiming Christ here. He's saying, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. He is not ashamed. In fact, he will proclaim 
You are my children. You are my children. And he points to each of us and he calls us by name and he says, you are my children if you have believed on me. And then he says again, I will put my trust in him. And who is he speaking of there? He's speaking, I will, Jesus is saying, I will put my trust in God the Father. What happened on the cross when Jesus died, when he breathed his words? <clears throat> he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. God, I'm trusting you. I am trusting you, not only that you will bring me back to life, that you will, but that you will bring all these children with me. And since I am the firstborn of the resurrection, to me, this is just amazing things just to think about. It is an amazing thing. He says, and again, behold, I and the children of God, children whom God has given me. God is going to, Jesus is going to proclaim our name to God. Jesus is putting his trust in the Father. He says, also in one place where he says, all that the Father has given to me will come to me from John chapter 6. All that the Father has given to me as children will come to me. And Jesus calls us family. He proclaims us into the family of God. He proclaims us his children. That to me is just a wonderful thing to understand that he proclaims our name and he proclaims us his children. But yet at the same time, God calls us to be humble, doesn't he? He calls us to be as little children, little children, to be humble, to be obedient. In the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, God calls the people of Israel to be humble and return to him. And he says in, um, in Isaiah chapter 40, he speaks and he says, a voice calls a uh, voice says call out and then he answered what shall i call out all flesh is as grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field the grass withers the flower fades when the breath of the lord blows upon it surely the people are grass and, and when we think about this it's just like well if we're his children why does he speak about us this way that we are just like flowers that fade or grass that dies? Why does he do that? Because he wants us to understand that we need to be humble, that know that we have a finite life because of the sin that we have committed. But the other thing he says he points out in verse 12, he says, he measures the earth's waters in the hollow of his hand. Just you know, in that little part of your hand down here, he measures all the earth's water in the hollow of his hand. God is elevating himself. He is putting us in our proper place so that we understand that where our help comes from is from God. And when we're down here in this lowly place, we think, well, I can fix things myself. So really? Really? All we do is dig ourselves into deeper trouble every day if we think about it. Because Israel had become a proud nation and they forgot their place in God's rule. They forgot that they had become God's representatives. They forgot that they were God's image bearers. When I like to use a phrase, an older phrase, they forgot that they were God's viceroys. And we know what the phrase viceroys is. It's kind of that person that's second in charge. <coughs> You know, we've heard the phrase vice president. Well, God is like the president. We are in a way over this world as his vice president. That's what God wants us to be in this world. But that's not going to happen in this lifetime. But it will. He wants to, us to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. But instead, Israel went rogue. And that is why he said, all flesh is as grass. You are like the flower that fades. 
And by putting ourselves under God's authority, we do become God's agents one more, once more. Not fully perfected, but one day that will be. But he does put us in charge of sharing his good news. The creator of this world, the savior of mankind, put us in charge of preaching the good news, proclaiming and sharing that good news of Jesus Christ with other people that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again. We live by faith, and that is what God wants us to be doing. We're going to find out about that later in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the great faith chapter, because those people died not receiving the promise that God had given them. When you say, well, what's, what's up with that? But they knew that it wasn't for this life. They knew that it wasn't for this world. They knew that it would, they believed in a new heaven and a new earth. They, they believed in a Messiah. And, and they would one day, that God would one day restore this broken world to its rightful place and restore us. We may not see it in our lifetime, but we believe this as well. He made this world for you and me for eternity. And as new creations in a new creation, all this became possible because of his death and resurrection. And I want to close with a passage from, from Job. Job was a man that went through many troubles. And in Job chapter 19, Verse 25 through 27, Job was down, not just, he, he lost his family, he lost his farm, his livestock, and everything. Well, he didn't quite lose his wife, but his wife told him to curse God and die. And I'm not sure if that's just the best <coughs> helpmate to have along, just telling you to curse God and die. But his friends were there all chiding him, telling him it was because of his sin that he was in this place. And what does Job have to say to this? Job 19. And I want us to close with this passage because we're going through lots of problems in this world. But here's the thing what Job says. As for me, I know my Redeemer lives. And at last, he will take his stand on earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. That's our hope, to be together as God's family, to be together. What, is he, what has he done? He has taken us from the potential that we are, the problem of sin, to that being a pioneer of our salvation, to be proclaimed into his family. And Job knew that he, it wasn't this life that he was talking about. He knew that he would die. He knew also that he would stand face to face with his Redeemer. And we do know this as well. We will stand face to face with our Heavenly Father, with our Creator, with our Redeemer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided so great a salvation. Such a wonderful thing. And Lord, we also know that in this life, many trials and tribulations will come. In fact, we will be hated. But Lord, we also know, we do believe, and we do trust that we and you win in the end because you have promised that in your word. And you've kept all these promises before. We know you will keep them now. Lord, we thank you for the promise of salvation. We thank you for the promise of a new heavens and a new earth. And we also thank you for that promise of being in your family for we have obtained that now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's close with one last song.